Hi there. In the last few years, there's been considerable debate about the propriety of mental health professionals commenting on the likely diagnoses of public figures, like politicians. No names. Uh, this is nothing new, really. Clinicians have been retrospectively diagnosing historical figures for ages. Lincoln, depression. Beethoven, bipolar disorder. Edvard Munch, panic attacks. It's a parlor game, like Scrabble, but, well, for even more boring people than that. Anyway, no one makes a peep about it. No problem. It's even considered a faintly honorable hobby. But fast forward to people in the present, about whom we may have even more information, and suddenly it's a no-go territory. And frankly, you can see why. Who wants yet another whole class of 24-hour news chatterers wittering on about the likely psychopathology of every politician on the ballot? It makes sense for us to restrain ourselves. But in this post, let's take a look at some of the reasoning against doing it. Why is it bad practice to diagnose these people? Well, because we don't get to do all the standard things we do to arrive at a diagnosis. And what are those? Well, we take the person out of their real life and put them in an office setting where they've never been before. And we sit them down and we ask them all kinds of questions about their symptoms, about their behavior, and about how they spend their days. And we watch how they act in that office. And maybe we give them some questionnaires to ask them even more questions about their life outside that little office. Great. Why do we do that? Well, because we cannot afford to send the clinician out into the client's real life and follow them around and observe them for a week. It costs too much. It takes too much time. But make no mistake, the only reason we do office assessments is to get a sense of what's happening out there. Because it's how you're doing in real life, in your real work, with your real relationships that counts. But there's a problem with office assessment. In fact, there are two. First, their behavior in the office isn't really what we're worried about. If someone drinks out of control in my office, but has complete control over their drinking everywhere else, the solution is easy. Just get them out of my office. Nobody cares. If you have panic attacks in a psychologist's office, but never anywhere else, no problem. The only reason we care is that what happens in the office probably happens outside as well, in what we might call the client's real life. Then it can be a problem. So our assessment relies on the idea the behavior inside our office is like a tiny model of how they are outside. If those worlds don't match, the diagnosis we arrive at in the office may be wrong. Now, the second problem is simpler. We're relying on people's report of what's going on out there in the real world. And sometimes they're not the greatest reporters. None of us are. We don't see the whole picture ourselves, and so we cannot report it all. And we disguise the truth from ourselves. We don't like to think we have an alcohol problem, let's say, so it doesn't enter our mind that we drink heavily five nights a week. We think it's occasional. And to be blunt, sometimes people lie. No, I don't drink to excess. No, I don't get violent with my wife. No, I'm not stealing from my employer. Both of these problems are really the same. They mean that the picture we get in this artificial assessment setting doesn't match the only setting that really matters, the client's life outside the office. 
So if you tell me I have to come up with a diagnosis for someone and you give me two choices, which do I pick? An hour and a half in my office using standard assessment questions and strategy plus some questionnaires? Or I can have a larger sample of a client's actual behavior outside my office, plus their letters, their speeches, and their entire Twitter account. Easy. I pick the office assessment, because ethically, that's what I have to use. But if you say, to heck with your guidelines, this is really important. We need to know. This person is going to make decisions that lives depend on. And maybe we're going to give him a nuclear button. Choose wrong and people die. You can have your office meeting or you can have the person's actual behavior in the setting that actually counts, the real world. Now what do you pick? I'd pick the real world. So would most of the clinicians I know because it eliminates most of the sources of distortion. Not all of them. I might get a slice of life where the person isn't depressed or paranoid or narcissistic or what have you. None of us is the same in every moment. And if I had all of a person's social media feeds, that's not going to give me the complete truth about them. Most people look great on social media. Look at the meal I just had. Look at the great vacation. Look at the, all the people at my birthday dinner. Look what a happy life I have. There's a lot of impression management. You probably do it yourself. But the distortion tends to be one way. Better. Most of us don't try to make ourselves look worse. If I get a person's Twitter feed, they might look better than they really are. Happier, more successful, more articulate, more thoughtful. But they're probably not going to look worse. This gives us an upper bound on how well they're doing. So let's say we wanted to have an opinion about the diagnosis of a public figure. Could we do it? Of course, we do it all the time. We just keep it to ourselves. <laughs>